I'm Kim Goff Cruz, and it is my privilege to welcome all of you today uh, to honor our veterans. Before we begin, I would like to thank our ROTC cadets and midshipmen for presenting the colors and to express our deep gratitude for the, to the Quinnipiac people for the land on which we stand. I also want to acknowledge and recognize our alumni leaders. The Yale Alumni Association is in the middle of a meeting uh, for the last couple of days. They have changed their schedule to join us uh, for this special event, so welcome. But I also want to make a special welcome, and that's to the students, the faculty, staff, and alumni who are with us today, who have served, who are serving, and who are preparing to serve. We are so grateful, all of us are so grateful for the freedoms and privileges that your sacrifices have made possible. Now, during our ceremony, you will hear from a veteran leader and a current student. And we will also honor a staff person who has supported and advocated for Yale veterans. Our speakers and honorees represent commitment to honor and country, to our veterans, and to those who care for and support them. Before we begin, it's my pleasure to introduce President Peter Salovey, who is going to share his thoughts about our esteemed veterans. President Salovey. Thank you, Kim, and good morning, everyone. I'm really thrilled to see so many students, faculty members, staff, and especially our alumni with us today as we commemorate Veterans Day. And I wish to begin by extending a special warm welcome to the veterans and Yale ROTC students whom we are honored to have here with us. You have our deepest gratitude and respect for your contributions to our country, for exemplifying a spirit of service which dates to the founding of our, of our institution and of the Republic. Indeed, the call to serve society was inscribed in this university's 1701 charter. And this call has been answered dutifully and with distinction by generations of Yale students, faculty, staff, and alumni for over three centuries. We think, for instance, of Nathan Hale, perhaps the most famous Yale alumnus to serve in the American Revolution, who perished with the lone lament that he had but one life to lose for his country. We think, too, of the nearly 30,000 Yalies who served in the First and Second World Wars, Korea and Vietnam, and service members up to the present, including those you see all around us today who are carrying forward a proud tradition. We also reflect with reverence on the service of those veterans who were denied freedom even as they fought valiantly for its cause. Patriots who, as Dr. Cortland Van Rensselaer Creed exclaimed, still rallied to the sound of liberty and union. Dr. Creed the first African-American to earn a medical degree at Yale, served honorably in the Union Army during the Civil War in spite of tremendous racism and discrimination. Closer to our time, patriots like Yale Collis alumnus and my friend, retired Lieutenant Colonel Enoch Woodhouse, Woody, one of the last surviving Tuskegee Airmen Endure, endured segregated conditions in defense of this country. I also think of Admiral Grace Hopper, who earned her PhD at Yale and is the namesake of one of our residential colleges. She led in fields that were, at the time, unwelcome to women. And now, in our era, we are resolved to build, as best we can, on their enduring legacies. Yale's Reserve Officers Training Corps program, for instance, was recently lauded by U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin for increasing diversity through the officers it produces, including in areas of the active duty force that are underrepresented by women. 
Yale Law School, meanwhile, is at the fore of the effort to rid the veterans' benefits system of racial disparities. And earlier this semester, the U.S. News and World Report recognized Yale as the best college in the nation for veterans, in part due to our commitment to ensuring that a Yale education is affordable to everyone. I don't love those rankings, but I do love it when we're number one. <laughs> of course, our tradition of service continues through the students who will one day join the eminent ranks of the Yale veterans community. The ROTC program on campus recently marked the 10th anniversary of its return. And the spirit of sacrifice that links these and future military members is a hallmark of the spirit of Yale itself. It is the desire to ensure the security and welfare of this and future generations. It is the desire to serve, to look beyond self-interest. It is, in short, the desire to contribute to the common good. I'm deeply grateful for the veterans here with us today who have given of themselves to a better world, and for the cadets and midshipmen of our ROTC program who have similarly felt and answered the call to duty. Your decision to serve in the armed forces is especially critical during this period of global turbulence. Conflicts are escalating. Democracies are backsliding. And right now, the spirit of division around the world seems stronger than ever. Yet, today, we look around this room and this community, and what we see is the spirit of service. It's a spirit forged over centuries. Indeed, the fabric of our nation is woven by the individuals who have defended it for nearly 250 years. The resilience and wisdom of our veterans help to build a nation, and their strength help to bind it together during difficult times. Their courage helped save a world torn apart by war twice. Their determination has protected millions from a life of oppression and hardship. And as recent years have underscored, their compassion and commitment to humanity have brought food, clothing, and shelter, medication to those in need of it most. The exigent crises we face as a country and global community remind us anew of the fragility of peace. Yet they also redouble our gratitude for those who have answered the call to protect it. In both peacetime and wartime, Yeles have answered this call to duty, and many have made the ultimate sacrifice for their country. Carved into the hallowed walls of Memorial Hall, right outside those doors, you can find the names of 1,020 Yale alumni killed in battle since the American Revolution. Out on Hewitt Quadrangle, the Memorial Cenotaph honors 225 Yale students and alumni who died in the Great War and the Ledyard Flagstaff is dedicated to the memory of a young Yale alumnus who died during the Philippine-American War. Today we assemble in the shadow of these campus landmarks and in awe of the valor to which they pay tribute and of the veterans who gave their loyalty to this nation. I join a grateful university community in saluting those who have so nobly served this country and advanced the cause of peace around the world. Thank you all very much.
grand architect of the universe, called by many names, in many languages, by many voices. Today, we ask that your guiding hands hold us and all sisters and brothers in military service near. We are grateful to all who now serve, all who have served, and for those who, in the words of President Abraham Lincoln, gave the last full measure of devotion in service of their country. We are joined in humility, gratitude, and our own measure of devotion, knowing that as we seek to understand an increasingly complex world, we are sheltered by the vigilant service of citizens to our republic. We ask special regards for those who have served, but who have not yet been found and returned home. And for those who have returned, but who have yet to find themselves at home. We honor our military and ask that whatever is required of them, be informed by your infinite wisdom, the light and truth, as they honorably and loyally seek to create a peaceful and secure future for us all. Amen. Good afternoon, President Solvay, Secretary Goff Cruz, Provost Strobel, Director Bajois, Rod Lowe, Dean Sodi, the Veterans Day Committee, distinguished guests, family and friends, members of our community, and of course, our veterans. To everyone here today, thank you for coming together to celebrate those who, during times of peace and war, swore to defend our nation and its most sacred principles. It's a privilege to be with you all today at an event hosted by a university with such a long-standing and storied tradition of service. Only a few moments walk away stands a statue of one of this nation's earliest and finest patriots, placed adjacent to the building he called home while a student here at Yale. Nathan Hale's famous last words, that his only regret is he had but one life to lose for his country, embodies the same principle that is held by every person who has worn our military's cloth. If you speak to a hundred different veterans, you'll hear a hundred different stories, but one principle is universally true. Each and every one of them pledged to serve a cause far greater than self, at great personal expense, and without any assurance of what the future may hold. I'm continually humbled and inspired by those with whom I served and by the veterans I've met since hanging up my uniform. And I want to thank everyone here today who has worn, currently wears, or one day will wear our nation's uniform. My story with the military, like many others, does not begin with a family tradition of martial service. I never really thought about joining the military until my senior year of high school. At the time, all I knew was that I had to get away from home, and the military seemed like a good opportunity to do so. The determining factor of why I chose to enlist in the Marines was, in all honesty, that I liked their uniforms the best. <laughs> Which I suppose is somewhat ironic, since I didn't know the Marines had flight suits, and that's the uniform I ended up wearing the most. <laughs> and so I shipped off to boot camp shortly after my high school graduation, not sure of what would become of me. I'll never forget that first night in boot camp. I remember thinking repeatedly that I'd made the worst decision of my life. But as you quickly learn in the military, you must adapt to new situations and challenges and excel in stressful environments. Whether it's making your bed with a perfect 45 degree fold in the corner while a drill instructor screams in your face, or calling an osprey to the deck at night in heavy dust while the enemy lurks in the darkness. And so, my initial apprehension gave way, and as the Marine Corps became my new home, I realized that I had made the greatest possible decision by enlisting. While I look back fondly on many moments with some of the greatest people I'll ever know, my time in the military also created some of my greatest struggles, and leaving those in the past at one point seemed insurmountable. Returning home from deployment was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Deployment itself was challenging enough. It was hard to start each day with a brief on the number of enemy killed in action over the previous 24 hours and the weapon systems we were expected to encounter throughout our flight. To navigate through airbursts and wonder if the next one would be the one that took us down. 
to see cities destroyed by airstrikes and the ravages of war, to point a machine gun at another human being and have to decide if he was the enemy hiding within a civilian population or an innocent bystander caught in the middle of a war he didn't ask for. But it was also hard to return from that to a place that no longer felt like home, to go about each day feeling like a part of me was lost in the desert. It was hard to leave behind a place where I felt that everything I did mattered, not knowing if I'd ever have that purpose in my life again. It was harder still to leave behind the military, along with the people who were there with me throughout it all. For several years after leaving the Marines, I didn't want anything to do with the military. I avoided reaching out to those I served with, and I did everything I could to reclaim who I was and leave the military forever in the past. But that's easier said than done. My non-commissioned officer bloodstripes were beaten in my legs, and my sergeant chevrons were pounded into my chest. I fought for my wings in the skies over Iraq, and I earned the right to wear the Eagle Globe and Anchor. These things are not given lightly, and once given, nothing can take them away. I'm grateful that they'll always be with me, and I no longer lament the part of me that never returned from the desert or avoid the memories of my time in uniform because those things made me who I am today. I'm forever grateful for those who helped me along this journey. Professor Jeannie Johnson for helping me find a path when I was left the Marines and for being a friend and mentor for nearly half a decade. Rose McCard for helping me navigate service after the military and for growing my love of foreign policy and international relations. Jeannie was my professor during my first semester of college. While I certainly felt out of place in our freshman introductory international relations course as a former Marine sergeant with a disheveled beard who had gra barely graduated high school, Jeannie recognized that I understood the importance of the material we were learning because I had lived through international relations at its most visceral level in Iraq. She immediately took me under her wing and has supported me constantly ever since. Rose was my supervisor at the State Department. As an Army officer who joined the State Department after transitioning from active duty, Rose quickly became an inspiration to me as I sought to regain a sense of purpose in life. Because of my experience in the Marines and Rose's belief in me, I was able to work on a project whose effects are right now being used by Ukraine to defend its independence, to represent State Department equities to the National Security Council, and to help formulate policy as crises develop throughout the world. Because of Jeannie and Rose, I found my post-military purpose in life in foreign relations. But Jeannie and Rose's support for me highlights something far more profound. Veterans bring something to the table that is impossible to find anywhere else. Veterans have real-world experience that is gained in the most trying of circumstances, skill sets that are developed in furtherance of the most serious tasks and an ability to succeed in the most challenging environments. I'm grateful for the incredible faculty at Yale Law School for recognizing this. At the start of her term, Dean Gherkin immediately set to work supporting veterans, and thanks to her efforts, Yale Law School isn't just the best place to study law, but is a place that veterans can truly call home. One of the greatest testaments to Yale Law's commitment to veterans is the Veterans Legal Services Clinic, which, under the leadership of Mike Wishney, Megan Brooks, and Jason Parkins, is a significant engine of improvement to veterans' benefits and has changed the lives of countless veterans for the better. It's telling that every semester, there's overwhelming student interest to work in the clinic. I also wouldn't be here today without my family support. It can't be easy for any parent to watch their child ship off to war, and I can't imagine the burdens my parents felt knowing they signed my contract for me when I was too young to enlist on my own. Our military families deserve nothing but the highest, our nation's highest respect and gratitude. They hold together families on their own for months and years. They say goodbye to parents, siblings, children, and significant others, and live through periods of incredible stress, limited communication, and immense worry. They often put their lives on hold and move to places far from familiar faces. Nothing we could do could ever repay the sacrifices you all have made. And of course, I'm grateful for those who are no longer with us, whose sacrifices are the reason we can be together today. At many Marine Corps ceremonies, there's an empty place set at a table for a fallen. While at first this table to me was just a solemn reminder of the nature of military service, as the years have passed, more and more friends have come to occupy that empty seat. You live with me every day, and I'm forever thankful for our memories together. While I once ignored this day, Veterans Day is now a day that I take pride in the best parts of my service and try and heal from the difficult ones, smile back on fond memories, and express gratitude for the challenges that the military imposed. Cherish those who are still with us and honor those who are gone, knowing that my time in the military has given me the tools to overcome the insurmountable 
and I'll always find inspiration in my brothers and sisters as they navigate their own paths. To my fellow members of the armed forces, however you choose to spend Veterans Day, I'm grateful to be here with you all today. Thank you for answering the call. Wherever you may be in your journey, whether you're a member of our ROTC who is training to take charge of your first command, you left the military decades ago, or you fall somewhere in between, I hope the future brings you nothing but joy and know that your brothers and sisters are rooting for your success. Thank you for taking the time today to honor our veterans. May we honor them every day by enjoying the blessings of this nation that they served. Thank you. So we, just so you know that our, our, our student is okay. She's talking, she just fainted. It is a little bit hot in here, I have to say. I, mean, I don't think they were expecting to be here for that long, but, but she's fine and we will continue with our program, okay? Um, and actually, why don't we give a round of applause to our students, by the way? <laughs> Michael, I want to tell you, your comments were really quite wonderful, so we are really grateful that you shared your story with us and that you chose to come to Yale, so welcome and thank you. Now, one of the things that was really poignant about what Michael was talking about was the, the need to have people in your sphere who support you as a veteran, wherever you may be, including at Yale. And right now, we want to, as a university, recognize someone who has made outstanding contributions to veterans with the Veterans Day Tribute Award. This year, it is my great honor to present the award to Risa Sodi, the Assistant Dean and Director of Academic Advising and Special Programs in Yale College. Risa. Now, many of us may know Risa because she has been at the university for 25 years. But for the last nine years, she has been the director of the Eli Whitney program, the Eli Whitney student program, and the transfer student programs. And most of our Yale College student veterans find their way to Yale and to New Haven through those two programs. In 2013, there were six student veterans in the Eli Whitney program. But today, there are 36 and Dean Sodi continues to provide the same individualized and loving attention and support to each Eli Whitney student with grace and generosity. Her support has made countless students feel as if they belong at Yale. For example, former Eli Whitney student, Yale College graduate, and current Yale Law School student, Hillary Browning, recalls feeling really cared for the moment she met Dean Sodi. In Hillary's time at Yale College, Dean Sodi provided not only academic support, but also personal guidance, which she said really helped her to succeed. But in addition to her supports of students, student veterans, 
and the like. She has also served on the Veterans Day Cer Ceremony Committee for many, many years. And so her dedication and support to veterans, to Yale's veterans in particular, are recognized today for the service that goes beyond the student community to the entire veterans community. So Risa, I am really pleased to present with you, to you today this award, if you come and join me, on behalf of the Veterans Day Committee in recognition of your support for all of our veterans at Yale. Please join me in welcoming her and also sharing our admiration and respect for her service. Now, I just saw that Senator Blumenthal has joined us, and I want to make sure that if you have time to make some comments, that would be wonderful for us. Welcome. Another alum as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Dean Thadi, and uh, congratulations to Yale. Uh, very proud to be a graduate of the law school here, as are two of my children and another of my children, a graduate of the college. And over the years, I have seen Yale become more and more respectful, I think is the right word, of our veterans since the days when I came here as a law student shortly after the Vietnam War. And Yale has been at the forefront of recognizing the immense contributions made by our veterans in a way that I think has provided a model for other educational institutions as I've seen them around the country. I serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee as well as on the Armed Services Committee. And I think the pattern in our great nation, the greatest in the history of the world, is that all too often, we fail, we utterly fail, to address the needs of our veterans, give them what they deserve when they most need it in the aftermath of their service. And that is true of the post 9-11 generation of veterans as well. Only literally this Congress did we succeed in passing a measure, it's called the PAC Act, that will provide care and benefits for veterans exposed to toxic chemicals, poisons, burn pits on the battlefield. 3.5 million <laughs> veterans. But it took years to do it. I started working on it a number of years ago. It was bipartisan. But the VA actually opposed us in this effort, just as it opposed us when we sought to get care and benefits for veterans who suffered as a result of Agent Orange exposure a generation before. And it took literally a generation to get that coverage. And now the PAC Act will provide the presumption of service connection when people develop 23 different kinds of cancers or liver disease, emphysema, all of the hideous diseases that result from being in the way of these toxic chemicals. If burn pits were located anywhere around Yale or around New Haven or anywhere in Connecticut, anywhere in the United States, they would be a scandal, there would be mass protests, but our military men and women were exposed to these toxic chemicals day after day, and I am sure some of the veterans here today know people who have suffered from those diseases. So I think one of the lessons is that honoring our veterans this day, fine to do. I'm proud of our state for having numerous ceremonies, and I've been to several of them already. 
rhetoric, words are good, but even better and even more important. And our obligation is to honor veterans in deed and action, not just in word. If you know a veteran who has been in the military and deployed, as two of my sons have, during these 20 years of war, make sure they get screened. On just this last Tuesday, every one of them is eligible for screening. Make sure they get screened, because cancers like glioblastoma, or more to the point, kidney, liver diseases can be caught early. And we need to invest in education, skill training, health care for our veterans, not only the physical wounds of war that are apparent when people leave, but also the invisible wounds of war, like these cancers that don't manifest until years after, or PTS and other mental health issues. Thank you for what you'll do to make sure that our veterans are taken care of. Uh, we're very fortunate to have here in West Haven one of the best VA hospitals in the whole country. It needs more investment as well. Again, action, not just words. And thank you to Yale, thank you to everyone who is here today for keeping faith with our veterans and honoring them as you're doing today. Thank you very, very much. All right, are you ready for a military salute? All right, let's get going. This is almost like the Harvard-Yale game, but this is like, so we're gonna really hear it now. Thank you. 
Let us go forth from this place of profound memory and deep meaning with grateful hearts, grateful for the service and sacrifice of our veterans and their families. Let us never forget all that they have done to bravely protect freedom and human rights. From the moment our veterans made the commitment to serve, they were committing to a life that would be forever changed. May we be ever mindful that the life of a veteran is always multidimensional and is rooted in the pride and promise of liberation coupled with the ever-present possibility of peril or alienation. All of these things are held in tension and contain a longing for a certain kind of peace to revive our weary world. As we honor our veterans and we seek to grow closer to this abiding peace, may we come to know a peace born from wisdom and understanding, a peace nurtured with compassion and mercy, a peace strengthened by courage and commitment. And may, may we all be blessed this day and every day by the shimmering light of our God of many names, our God who creates, sustains, and embraces all life. Amen. So that is our ceremony, and I want to thank you all for coming. Um, many thanks to the planning committee and uh, the, particularly our team in uh, the student life office, the secretary's office, who I know the military is prepared for, to make changes at a, at a dime, but they have done pretty well, so I want to thank you very much for changing everything <laughs> quickly. Um, to our participants in our program, thank all of you for being on the stage with us. And I also want to give a special shout out to the Yale College, uh, the Yale School of Music Brass Ensemble. Really. <laughs> so as we, as we close, I, I want us to remember that when today has passed and when we return to our busy lives, and they are busy nowadays, I want us to remember to continue to remember the men and women of Yale who have faithfully and honestly served all of us. To, they protected us, they've served us. We are a stronger and more diverse community because of them. So thank you all for your service and have a really, really good day.